One night in 1946, three lecturer friends at Cambridge University went to the movies to enjoy the anthology horror movie Dead of Night. This film opens with the protagonist arriving at a countryside estate where he encounters an assorted cast of characters who recount their disturbing stories. After killing one of them, the protagonist wakes up from what appeared to be just a nightmare. But a phone call summons him back to the very same estate, thus resetting the entire story in motion. Before anyone wonders, no, this is not a channel called Movie Graphics, and we're actually talking astronomy and cosmology today. You see, those three friends happen to be lecturers in astronomy, mathematics, and cosmology, and the cyclical structure of that horror film inspired them to formulate one of the most credible challenges to the Big Bang Theory. One according to which the universe is infinite, timeless, and more crucially, without a defined beginning. This is the steady state theory of the universe. Today, the Big Bang Theory is the most widely agreed upon explanation for the origin of our universe, but this hasn't always been the case. For at least two decades, steady state appeared to garner more consensus. Even as recently as April of this year, 2024, new publications have cast doubt on the Big Bang. But let's take it one step at a time. What does the Big Bang Theory entail exactly? Well, the theory was first formulated in 1927 as a hypothesis of the primeval atom by Belgian Catholic priest, physicist, and astronomer Georges Lemaitre. The label Big Bang only stuck in 1949. Ironically, this was intended as a slightly derogatory phrase, and it was coined by one of the founders of steady state theory, English astronomer Fred Hoyle. And we'll get to him later, but for the moment, let's just stick with Lemaitre. According to his hypothesis, the universe originated from a single point, infinitely hot and dense. Around 30.7 billion years ago, a sudden, explosive expansion took place, inflating the primeval atom faster than the speed of light. According to physicist Alan Guth, this phase lasted a fraction of a second. To be precise, 10 to the power of minus 32 of a second. After this initial sudden and inflation, a second phase, known as reheating, set in. This was the process by which radiation and particles began populating the universe. In the following stage, some 380,000 years after the initial bang, free electrons floating in the void started aggregating with protons and neutrons, thus forming the first atoms. This process can also be described as a transition from a plasma state of matter to a neutral gas. According to NASA researchers, this process allowed for photons to permeate through the initial chaotic soup of the universe. Now, photons are the most elementary particle of electromagnetic radiation, such as light. And this primordial light shining through our early universe has been described as the afterglow of the Big Bang, or more appropriately, as the Cosmic Microwave Background, or CMB. From that moment onwards, the universe has been doing mostly fine for billions of years. Crucially, it has never stopped expanding since that very first incredibly fast, incredibly violent burst. This is a key aspect of the primeval atom or Big Bang theory, as we live in an ever-expanding cosmos, stretching out at a measurable rate from the primordial point of origin. The theory first posited in 1927 by Father Lemaitre is now mainstream, but for much of the first half of the 20th century, it was actually the outlier. Before and immediately after that year, models based on continuous creation were all the rage. Now, this point was quite complex for our tiny little brains, so allow us to clarify it. According to the Big Bang Theory, all matter currently present in the universe was contained within that incomprehensibly dense primeval point. On the other hand, continuous creation models maintain that matter is constantly created from radiation, and this new matter replaces the old matter, which is converted into energy in stellar processes. So, new matter comes in, replaces the old matter. The overall result is that the universe is kept in a steady state. American physicist William Macmillan was the first to propose such a steady state model in 1918. Ten years later, his colleague James Jeans speculated that matter was continuously created in the center of the spiral nebula, where matter is poured into our universe from some other spatial dimension so that they appear as points at which matter is continually created. Even Albert Einstein was an early proponent of steady state models, as discovered by a team of researchers at Waterford Institute of Technology, Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies, and the University of Cambridge. The researchers viewed an unpublished four-page manuscript drafted by Einstein in 1931 and titled On the Cosmological Problem. In his paper, the famous scientist proposed a mechanism to explain how the density of matter remains constant even as the radius of the universe keeps expanding. Einstein concluded that new matter continuously formed from empty space, a process which also determines the expansion of our universe. Without going into specific details, which would be 
totally beyond our grasp. Anyway, the team of researchers identified some flaws in the equations written by Einstein to prove his steady state model. Their conclusion was that, quoting, Einstein discovered the error at a later point, realized the model led to a trivial solution, and set the work aside without correcting the equation. Besides these precedents, what is today referred to as steady state theory was formally developed by Cambridge lecturers Fred Hoyle, Herman Bondi, and Thomas Gold. Those are the three friends at the start of our episode who enjoyed a thrilling night at the movies. While returning home from the cinema, Gold suggested producing a movie with a cyclical structure, similar to Dead of Night, so that a spectator could start viewing it at any point. He then expanded his thinking to the entire universe. Could it be that the universe was like his hypothetical film, an, an endless cyclical reel with no beginning and no end? More precisely, Gold wondered if the universe, as it expanded, was being replenished with newly formed matter. Fred Hoyle worked out a set of complex calculations which suggested that matter could indeed be created on a continuous basis. And if matter was actually being created everywhere all the time, this meant that the universe would have to expand to make space for it. So uh, let's break this apart, shall we? The fact that the universe is constantly expanding has been widely circulated since 1929, when American astronomer Edwin Hubble published his namesake Hubble's Law. According to Hubble's observation, galaxies move away from Earth at a speed proportional to their distance. The further away the galaxy, the faster the speed. This law implies that the average distance between galaxies is increasing. The universe, therefore, must be expanding over time. Hoyle, Bondi, and Gold brought a new assumption into the picture. The continuous creation of new matter at the small rate of one atom of hydrogen per six cubic kilometers of space per year. The cosmos sounds pretty stingy, if you ask me, but according to our trio of movie-going lecturers, this rate is actually enough to form new stars and galaxies. To recap, then, the two essential ingredients of this theory are new matter is being constantly created and the universe is constantly expanding. So, creation and expansion. That doesn't sound exactly like a steady state, does it? Well, the thing is that Hoyle, Bondi, and Gold were thinking about the mean density of matter. Once again, if new matter constantly comes into a constantly expanding universe, the mean density of matter in the cosmos will remain constant. Hence, their model describes the universe as being in a steady state. Another important element of this theory is that the universe, however expanding, is stationary on a large scale. This is known as the perfect cosmological principle, according to which the universe is infinite in size, infinitely old, and destined to an infinite future. And at this point, you might be thinking, but how about the creation of new matter, as demonstrated by Hoyle? How about the birth of new stars and the evolution of planets. In fact, the steady state theory admits that changes may take place, but only on a very small localized scale. But as new matter is created, old matter fades into nothingness. As stars burst into life, old stars exhaust their fuel and stop shining. So, if we look at a large region of space, some tens of millions of light years across, we may realize that the average amount of light emitted by the stars does not vary over time. Once again, this brings us to the conclusion that the cosmos is endless, homogeneous, and timeless. It is the same in all directions and doesn't evolve over time. This concept is clearly in antithesis with the primeval atom hypothesis or Big Bang, which identifies a clear point in space and time in which the universe blew up into existence. The big question is, did the steady state theory make sense? I hope I'm not giving away too many spoilers here, but despite the initial popularity of the steady state theory, eventually the Big Bang came out on top. The first blows against steady state came courtesy of observations from radio telescopes in the early 1960s. These observations proved the existence of a large number of radio sources at a distance of billions of light years. This led to two conclusions. First, those sources had emitted their signals billions of years ago. And second, billions of years ago, there were more radio sources than there are now. This last conclusion implies that the universe is changing at more than just a localized small scale, which in itself contradicts steady state theory. Furthermore, in 19 1963, astronomer Martin Schmidt discovered a new class of celestial bodies, up to a thousand times brighter than the Milky Way, but much smaller. Astronomy buffs should have recognized these objects as quasars. Now, quasars are found only at huge distances from the Earth, which implies that the light we see today was actually emitted billions of years ago. Therefore, the fact that quasars only existed billions of years ago provides more evidence that the universe has changed over time. The steady state theory took another hit in 1965, thanks to an accidental discovery by two engineers 
engineers working for Bell Telephone Laboratories, Arno Penzias, and Robert Wilson. One of their radio receivers picked up some anomalous data, which Princeton University researcher Robert Dick identified as being evidence of the CMB, the cosmic microwave background. To oversimplify, Penzia, Wilson, and Dick had picked up the faint background's echo left behind by the early stages of the primordial Big Bang. The existence of the CMB corroborates Lemaitre's hypothesis, but it cannot be explained by proponents of steady state. But they did try by arguing that this type of radiation was emitted by one or more supernovas. Extensive research on the CMB proved that it was equal in any direction of the universe and thus could not have been emitted by several scattered supernovas. Later research further piled on in favor of Team Lemaitre. Take the abundance of light elements, such as helium isotopes and deuterium, for example. These were likely formed in the very hot, very dense first minutes after the Big Bang. And finally, we have to take into account the Doppler effect. This fundamental principle explains how perceived changes in the frequency of light, sound, or other waves depend on how a source and an object move toward each other. This effect influences the light emitted by celestial bodies. If a star or planet moves away from us, its light moves towards longer wavelengths. In scientific jargon, it's said that the body is redshifting. On the other hand, if a celestial body is moving toward us observers, its light waves appear shortened. In this case, the body is blue shifting. Measurements of light emitted by stars have so far shown that all galaxies are redshifting, i.e. they're moving away from us. This observation further confirms the Big Bang theory as it shows that our universe is in a constant state of expansion. Eventually, the theory of Hoyle, Bondi, and Gold gradually fell out of favor with cosmologists as more and more evidence supported the initial hypothesis of Lemaitre. As Stephen Hawking once described steady state, the steady state theory was what Karl Popper would call a good scientific theory. It made definite predictions which could be tested by observation and possibly falsified. Unfortunately for the theory, they were falsified. And you'd be forgiven for thinking that the matter is settled. The observable cosmos has a defined point of origin and has been steadily expanding since then. But also fast, as not everybody agrees with established academia. An article by science writer Stav Dimitropoulos, published by Popular Mechanics in April 2024, has brought attention to a 2022 paper by Jack Willinchick, writing for Progress in Physics, which, quote, claims that the Big Bang might be a bust. Willinchick himself is quoted as saying, no, the universe did not start as an exploding atom or anything. There's no beginning and no end to the universe. Now, we should specify here that Mr. Willinchick is an amateur astronomer and lawyer by trade, but it appears that he did do his homework. Willinchick scrutinized the Big Bang Theory and claimed that its weak point is its reliance on the Doppler effect as a means to prove it. According to him, the Doppler effect is a 180-year-old theory nobody has backed up with experimental evidence. Therefore, Willinchick highly doubts that celestial bodies may be redshifting. In fact, he doubts whether whether a redshift is indicative of movement at all. The author of the paper based his observations on a spectroscopy test first used by astronomer William Huggins in 1868. To clarify, spectroscopy is the measurement of spectra, i.e. the intensity of light emitted by celestial bodies. He then asked a professional astrophysicist to process spectrometry data provided by the Keck Observatory in Hawaii. According to Willinchick, the result of his studies are aligned with the cosmological model known as the tired light model, itself incompatible with the Big Bang. The tired light was first conceived by Swiss astronomer Fritz Zwicky in 1929, who attributed the universe's redshift to photons losing energy as they traverse the cosmos. Hence, the phenomena of redshifting is not due to movement, rather due to the loss of energy. Therefore, Willinchick concluded that the universe is not expanding, but rather it is static. The author attacked the Big Bang theory and the Doppler effect also from another angle, citing Isaac Newton's corpuscular theory of light. According to this theory, light is made up of corpuscules, or tiny particles, traveling in a straight line. These corpuscules come from in different sizes, with the larger ones emitting blue light while the smaller ones radiate red light. Adhering to this theory, Willinchick challenges the fact that the different colored shifts are dependent on the wavelength of light emitted by a celestial body. Actually, the author rejects the idea that light must be a wave. In his own words, if light is not in waves, then there goes the Doppler theory because the entire theory is based on the idea that light is in waves. Popular Mechanics asked Professor of Physics Stephen Holler of Fordham University to review Jack Willinchick's paper. His verdict, quoting, The premise that the Big Bang is a big bust due to its reliance on the Doppler effect is a big leap in logic. Doppler's theory has been tested repeatedly 
and has held up. Professor Holler further argued that without relying on the Doppler effect, uh, we would not have been able to engage in extraterrestrial exploration at all. Quoting again, Extraterrestrially, we have been able to reconcile the chemical composition of stars and planets by noting the correspondence of spectral lines with known lines observed from chemicals on the Earth through Doppler spectroscopy. Holler concluded by admitting that science may never have 100% conclusive proof that the Big Bang theory is correct. Nonetheless, it is our best cosmological model to describe the origins of the universe, corroborated by decades of observations. Quoting again, We do not live in a world of alternative facts. We must go where the evidence points. There is nothing to suggest that the Big Bang is a myth at present. Once again, you'd be forgiven to think that the Big Bang versus steady state matter is settled once and for all. Well, maybe it is until a new hypothesis emerges. And by the way, should we be grateful that the debate is settled? Or rather, should we be grateful for the fact that there has been an ongoing debate? To conclude, we'd like to borrow some words and some thoughts from Yuri Balashov, professor of philosophy at the University of Georgia in the United States. In a 1994 paper, he argued, cosmology on the whole gained from this controversy. The early success of steady state theory, in fact, stimulated research in the fields of stellar nuclear synthesis and radio astronomy. Both fields of research, especially radio astronomy, eventually contributed to disprove steady state and propelled science toward confirming the Big Bang model of the universe. In Balashov's own words again, it is not at all obvious that these and some other achievements would have been made so rapidly if there had not been a steady state theory to be defeated. And that's the beauty of science. No hypothesis is conclusively wrong, nor conclusively right until it is proven or disproven by evidence. However outlandish, however subject to being discredited, every new hypothesis, every new theory, concept, or model is another log thrown onto the bonfire of scientific debate, a fire whose flames have propelled our earthbound minds and even our bodies closer and closer to the secrets of the universe.